Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Melanie. This is Adventures in Hostessville, and welcome to the fourth episode of the Vintage Magazine Project, where we try to figure out history by digging through old magazines. And today is the final week of the 1952 Good Housekeeping. First off, Welcome to my garage. We are outside uh, today because I'm gonna be doing a little painting um, and air circulation is good. Also though, I live in Minnesota and it's January, so there might be some breaks where I have to go get tea and such. But this is the last week of January, so it's the last week will be in 1952, and I wanted to make sure that we grabbed the best possible article for it. There's maternity suits. I don't really need that. There is a checklist of urinary conditions that's specific for babies, though, and I don't have one of those. Um, there's a don't lose money on laundry, which is great, but we haven't had a dryer since we discovered seven gas leaks in the basement in November, so that's kind of a touchy issue for me right now. Um, but I, we do have this article on page... What is it, 98, the long, long table. This table is not just long, it is double long. And then on page 100, there's another article called the flexible long table. And on page 102, there is, of course you've a place for a long table. So obviously Good Housekeeping really wants me to have a long table, and who am I to disobey? And they do say that if you don't have the money to buy one, hello, that you can make one out of saw horses and an old door. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, I've got the door here, as you can see. When I first read this article last September, I think, I just happened to notice walking home one day that one of my neighbors had uh, this door out by their garbage, so I took it. And then I waited four months for somebody to be throwing out saw horses, and they never were. And what I'm trying to make is one that I can use outside for parties and such because we can't be close to people. We can't be inside right now. And this is a great time for me to make kind of an outdoor picnic table kind of thing. Here's the thing. In the article, they tell you to use a plywood door. And I was like, oh, gross. Look at this amazing um, paneled vintage solid wood door. It's so heavy. This is what I have because it's been sitting in my garage for four months. I'm gonna use it, but if you try this project, get a get like a hollow core door. Okay, so I'm gonna put this, oh dear, onto the sawhorses. And this is the kind of thing that I think if you had friends would be, oh golly, would be really great. Ooh, how? strong am I? How strong are these sawhorses? The table is very, very dirty, so I am going to wash it. I have got some rubber gloves, not just because they're cute, but actually um, I just thought they'd be a little warmer. It, it is actually 14 degrees outside, so. Oh, I didn't bring a rag. Dang nabbit. So uh, the reason that Good Housekeeping thinks that everybody needs a long table is that it is really flexible, hence the article, The Flexible Long Table. And another thing they suggest that it might be really good for is being a desk. Because, contrary to a lot of popular opinion, a lot of women in the 1950s worked. Um, I wonder if this is lead paint. In researching this episode, one of the places that I found that women were working a lot in 1952 was the LAPD. All right, that's pretty clean. Um, it is also pretty wet, so there's not a lot I can do as far as painting it until it dries. Now the paint method that they've said that I should use, they suggest black and gold spatter dash is nice. 
So I looked up spatter dash just to make sure it was what I thought it was, and it's actually a plastering process where you throw the sand mixture at a wall before you plaster it, which sounds very fun, but doesn't seem like it would make a good table service. So I'm assuming they mean the second definition, which is just splatter paint. But I found this paint in my basement. It is gloss white oil-based Rust-Oleum. I don't know whose this is. It may have also been in my basement since 1952, so it's super period appropriate. So I'm gonna just, this is actually coming open pretty easy, and ugh, oh. Okay, it's actually stirring up pretty smoothly. It doesn't smell off any more than oil-based paint usually does. Okay, so let's let's do this. What let's do what? What are we doing? Okay. So the LAPD is actually getting quite a bit of attention from the public in 1952, and that is because just prior to this um, issue coming out the first episode of Dragnet aired on TV. If you're not familiar with the show Dragnet, you do know the theme song. Dum, da dum, dum. Dum, da dum, dum, dum. Like, it's a great theme song. The guy that created this show was named Jack Webb, and he started this as a radio show because he was interested in giving the police a better appearance in media. Now, up to this point, it hadn't been great in the movies as far as what cops looked like. So going all the way back to silent films, you've got stuff like the Keystone Cops, who are completely ridiculous and always getting, you know, their pants pulled down by dogs. And, and then coming into the 30s and 40s, you've got a lot of these noir movies are really popular. They portray a lot of times the cops as being super corrupt. They're on the take. And Jack Webb wants to change this and portray cops as good guys and heroes. So he actually gets together with the LAPD and he's like, hey, will you help me out? I want this to be real. You know, it's sort of a two-sided deal. The LAPD said, yes, we will help you with this show and we'll make sure it's super true to life, but also then we get to okay every episode. So it really glorifies cops and they all look super terrific. His character, Joe Friday, is just like the greatest guy. Is that more true than the Keystone Cops? It's probably somewhere in between. I went back and watched a couple of these episodes and the very first episode I got super excited because Joe Friday runs up the steps of City Hall and he goes inside and I'm like, go downstairs, go downstairs, go to the basement, go to room 63. He doesn't go to room 63. He goes upstairs and, and diffuses a bomb or something like that. But in the basement of City Hall in the 1950s was room 63, and that was run by this woman, Rhoda Cross. I'm gonna tell you all about her as soon as I get this painted. Okay, so the entire thing has one coat on it. I do not have a coat on me because I didn't want to get paint all over my coat and I knew I would. I already have it all over everything else. But I like, um, can you see this? How the, there's just raw wood underneath where the key plate was and I think that looks kind of cool. So I'm gonna kind of um, paint around that. If I can move my fingers. Okay, so road across, working for the LAPD. So she is the chief statistician of the LAPD, which means it's her job to keep all of the files on criminals and crimes that have been committed. She's actually been at the LAPD at this point for um, about 25 years. She started working right out of college. She went to some Bible college and got a math degree and then got out of college and said the only statistician's job that she could find that sounded interesting at all was working for the LAPD. And this is the mid-20s, and it's right around this time this guy, August Vollmer, is working 
with the LAPD. He's considered sort of the father of modern policing. So one of the things he does while he's there is institute some more record keeping. And what he uses to do it, because of course this is well before computers, are punch cards. So punch cards are exactly what they sound like. They are little, uh, you know, thick paper cards that you can punch holes in. They have typically 80 columns. And then depending on the column, where you punch them in uh, creates an alphanumeric sort of code, basically. So Vollmer hires a number of people, but one of them is Rhoda Cross. And he's like, you know what? She's great. You should put her in charge. She ends up taking over the department. She's there well after Vollmer is long gone. And she will only hire women because she does agree that they are sort of better at the manual process of punching in the codes, but she also thinks that the woman's intuition is really important. Every time there was a crime, they would punch the information and the statistics from it in onto one of these punch cards. By 1952, they've got about 14 million of these cards stored in City Hall. They take up space, right? These are not computer files. So she reworks the whole uh, police report form for LAPD. By 1952, she is credited with having solved 78 murders on her own and a bunch of different crimes. And that is considering she never leaves City Hall. Okay, the, the first coat is pretty good. It's not perfect. It's not going to be perfect. But I'm going to go ahead and splatter paint while it's still wet because I need to go inside and warm up. So let's get this splatterable. So while I'm doing this, um, I want to tell you about some of Rhoda Cross's greatest hits. Her most famous one is this crime that she solved in apparently 20 minutes because there had been a uh, safe cracking. And they said, here's what we know. Um, they had this really specific kind of work they did with the acetylene torch. They disposed of the guard in this way and a couple of other things. So she gets her cards and she puts them through and like, and she's like, these three guys, check these guys. They're probably working as a team. And they were. And the cops go to the first guy's house, like, again, 20 minutes later. And all three of the guys are in there, like, in the process of splitting up the loot. <laughs> Road across. Foiled, foiled. OK. Oh. Yeah, that's what splatter paint looks like, all right? So another one that she had is that there was this uh, series of robberies that were happening for this guy that everybody said he's got a big walrus mustache. That's the only thing they could say. And everybody's like, there has been no criminal or anyone really wearing a big walrus mustache in a quarter century. And so one of her assistants, Bertha Bindrup, amazing name, um, Bertha's like, he must be using it to hide something even more obvious. So they go through their files to find if they can find a criminal with a cleft palate. And sure enough, they go to his house. And he's like, me? What? No, I had nothing to do with it. And they're like, then why is there this giant fake walrus mustache in your house? There's another one uh, where there were a series of robberies. And she kind of ran it through. And she was like, hold on. All of the victims work for this same streetcar company. And she's like, OK, well, let's see. What else can I find that they have in common? But she runs them through, and she finds another variable is that all of the guys who were the victims were single. So who would know, and why would it matter? And she says, it's probably somebody that works there, and that if they know, oh, those guys are working now, since they know they're single, they know there's not going to be anybody home, and they're safe to go rob their house. So sure enough, it turns out to be a guy whose job was to call in um, additional help you know, like overhire, basically, on the streetcar company. And if he would call in somebody that was single, he'd be like, whoop, off to their house. So Rhoda Cross runs this department for at least 30 years. Um, I couldn't find a lot out about her and what happened to her after this magazine article was published. The last thing I found was there was an article in like the LA Examiner or something in the 60s that she had busted another criminal at home because she thought she was having trouble with her party line. And she was like, I can always hear other people. It's not working right. Phone company's like, no, no, it's fine. Everything's fine. And it turns out that it was a wiretapping thing that she was catching. And so she caught those criminals. <laughs> 
you wiretapped the wrong wire, criminals. This is really very fun. And it looks like <laughs> it looks like a smock that a preschool art teacher would wear in 1987. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me. Um, I will keep you posted on if that table ever gets dry. I will post that on Facebook and Instagram, so follow me there. Subscribe to me on YouTube, and if you want to be a super special supporter, you can subscribe to me on Patreon. The links to all of those things are below. Thanks a bunch, and I'll see you next week for something that is hopefully indoors. Ugh. Ugh. That got in my face.